Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Westlake Corporation fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings conference call. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's remarks, you will be invited to participate in a question and answer session. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, this conference is being recorded today, February 20th, 2024. I would now like to turn the call over to today's host, Jeff Holly, Westlake's Vice President and Treasurer. Sir, you may begin. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Westlake Corporation Conference Call to discuss our fourth quarter and full year results for 2023. I'm joined today by Albert Chow, our President and CEO, Steve Bender, our Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and other members of our management team. During the call, we will refer to our two reporting segments, Performance and Essential Materials, which we refer to as PEM or Materials, and Housing and Infrastructure Products, which we refer to as HIP or Products. Today's conference call will begin with Albert, who will open with a few comments regarding Westlake's performance. Steve will then discuss our financial and operating results, after which Albert will add a few concluding comments, and we'll open the call up to questions. During the fourth quarter of 2023, we recorded a non-cash impairment charge of $475 million related to the company's epoxy business, as well as a $150 million charge to fully resolve certain liability claims that are currently not being covered by certain of our excess insurance carriers. We refer to these two charges as identified items in our earnings release and on this conference call. References to income from operations, EBITDA, net income, and earnings per share on this call exclude the financial impact of the identified items. As such, comments made on this call will be in regard to our underlying business results using these non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures is provided in our earnings release, which is available in the investor relations section of our website. Today, management is going to discuss certain topics that will contain forward-looking information that is based on management's beliefs, as well as assumptions made by and information currently available to management. These forward-looking statements suggest predictions or expectations and thus are subject to risks or uncertainties. These risks and uncertainties are discussed in Westlake's Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2022 and other SEC filings. We encourage you to learn more about these factors that could lead our actual results to differ by reviewing these SEC filings, which are also available on our Investor Relations website. This morning, Westlake issued a press release with details of our fourth quarter and full year results. This document is available in the press release section of our website at westlake.com. We have also included an earnings presentation which can be found in the Investor Relations section on our website. A replay of today's call will be available beginning today, two hours following the conclusion of this call. This replay may be accessed via Westlake's website. Please note that information reported on this call speaks only as of today, February 20th, 2024, and therefore you are advised that time-sensitive information may no longer be accurate as of the time of any replay. Finally, I would advise you that this conference call is being broadcast live through an internet webcast system that can be accessed on our webpage at westlake.com. Now, I would like to turn the call over to Albert Schell. Albert? Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. We appreciate you joining us to discuss our fourth quarter and full year 2023 results. Excluding the identified items, for the fourth quarter of 2023, we reported net income of $93 million or 72 cents per share, an EBITDA of $390 million on sales of $2.8 billion. While overall sales revenue was below the year ago period due to lower average sales prices in the PEM segment, we are pleased that our fourth quarter total sales volume increased 7% compared to the fourth quarter of 2022, with North American demand strengths partly offset by lower sales volumes in our international operations. 
Regionally, our volume and price declines 2023 were most impacted in our European operations, which were pressured by a weak macroeconomic backdrop and imports into Europe from Asia. The volume and price declines were most felt in our base epoxy business, driven by the very weak economic environment in Europe and China, along with significant new global epoxy capacity additions. These capacity additions, which were primarily in China, were met with weak regional demand, driving a significant increase in Asian exports to Europe and other regions. These Asian export volumes were aggressively priced as some Asian competitors received energy subsidies to stimulate exports. At a time when European energy costs were still relatively high, in part due to the ongoing war in Ukraine. As a result of these factors, our European based epoxy resin business experienced a sharp and sudden decline in profitability. To reflect these market changes, along with our current outlook for global operating rates to remain under pressure, we recorded a non cash impairment charge in our base epoxy business in the Netherlands in the fourth quarter. We have begun to implement actions to reduce our costs and improve the profitability of our European businesses. The cost savings we're expecting across our company-wide cost reduction programs are $125 to $150 million in 2024, after achieving 2023 cost savings of $110 million. Before turning the call over to Steve to review our financial results in more detail, I want to make, take a few minutes to review our accomplishments in 2023. Our HIP segment achieved record income from operations of $710 million and a record EBITDA margin of 23% as we further integrated and achieved synergies from the Borrow, Lasco, and Dimex acquisitions. We are very pleased with the evolution of this segment, which produced back-to-back -back record results over the past two years even with the economic challenges in the residential building market. These record results provide stability to our overall earnings in 2023 with an asset light cash generative business model with leading positions in North America. Our constant focus on cash flow generation enabled Westlake to generate $2.3 billion of cash from operations and $1.3 billion of free cash flow after investing over $1 billion to maintain and improve our plants and equipment. The solid cash flow generation, strength of business, and confidence in the company's future allowed us to return approximately $250 million to shareholders in 2023, including an increase of our quarterly dividends by 40% to $0.50 cents per share, which demonstrates our commitment to rewarding shareholders. We finished the year with a solid investment grade rated balance sheet, highlighted by $3.3 billion of cash and equivalents, providing flexibility to pursue opportunities as they present themselves. Finally, in conjunction with the publication of our sixth annual sustainability report in October, we added five additional sustainability goals to our existing CO2 emissions intensity reduction target. These five new goals address water usage, health and safety, community engagement, diversity and inclusion, and the circular economy, and are an important part of our overall approach towards stewardship of our environment and communities. Taken together, I'm very proud of our 2023 accomplishments given the challenging global economic environment. And I'd like to thank our nearly 16,000 team members for their hard work and dedication that enabled these achievements and the record HIP results. I would now like to turn the call over to Steve to provide more detail to our, on our financial results for the fourth quarter and the full year of 2023. Thank you, Albert, and good morning, everyone. As Albert discussed, our fourth quarter of 2023 financial results were reduced by $475 million 
as we fully impaired the base epoxy resin business in the Netherlands to reflect a change in the fair value of these assets as a result of the rapid deterioration in global epoxy markets over the past year. Asian and European economies remain weak throughout 2023, and we saw a flood of Asian epoxy imports into European markets as large Asian epoxy capacity additions were completed at a time of persistently elevated power, energy, and raw material cost in our European operations. Separately, as we previously disclosed, we reached settlements to resolve certain liability claims we recognized a charge of $150 million in the fourth quarter of 2023 to reflect the portion of the total settlement amount that is subject to dispute with some of our insurance carriers. We are pleased to have fully resolved these liability claims while we work with our insurers to resolve the disputed portion of the settlement amount. As a reminder, my comments regarding income from operations, EBITDA, net income, and earnings per share all exclude the financial impact of both the non-cash impairment and the litigation settlement charges. Westlake reported net income of $93 million, or $0.72 per share, in the fourth quarter on sales of $2.8 billion. Net income for the fourth quarter of 2023 decreased $139 million from the fourth quarter of 2022 as a result of lower average sales prices and margins in PIM particularly for caustic soda and epoxy resin, and $20 million of restructuring cost as we optimized operations in our HIP segment. When compared to the third quarter of 2023, net income decreased by $190 million in the fourth quarter due to lower average sales prices in PIM, unfavorable sales mix changes in PIM, and a typical seasonal decline in HIP sales volume. For the fourth quarter of 2023, our utilization of the FIFO method of accounting resulted in an unfavorable pre-tax impact of $35 million compared to what earnings would have been reported on the LIFO method. This is only an estimate and has not been audited. For the full year of 2023, we reported net income of $1.1 billion and EBITDA of $2.6 billion on sales of $12.5 billion. Compared to our record 2022 results, net income attributable to Westlake declined by $1.1 billion as growth in HIPS income from operations, more than offset by lower PEM earnings, primarily due to lower average sales prices and margins. Turning to our segment results, PEM EBITDA of $1.6 billion in 2023 was below our record 2022 results, primarily due to lower global sales prices and margins as a result of softer demand created by weaker global economic conditions and customer destocking at a time when new global capacity additions for polyethylene and epoxy resin entered the market. However, after customer destocking ended as 2023 drew to a close, we saw signs of improvement in our sales volumes, which rose 6% year over year in the fourth quarter with improving signals in demand strength that have carried into the first quarter of 2024 for many of our PEM product categories. On a quarterly basis, PEM's fourth quarter EBITDA of, 2000, of 200, 201 million decreased by 138 million from the third quarter. The sequential decline in EBITDA was the result of lower average sales prices, particularly for caustic soda, which were driven by increased export demand and price changes that occurred from the third quarter. With the lower sales prices, we saw an increase in demand led by caustic soda that drove a 4% sequential increase in our sales volume in contrast to the historic pattern of slower customer orders and sales into year end. While it is still early in 2024, we have recently seen signs of firming demand after sales prices for most of our major PEM products were relatively stable on a month-to-month -month basis within the fourth quarter. Moving to our HIP segment, $710 million of income from operations set a new annual record in 2023 despite lower revenue as the strong value of our brands allowed us to remain disciplined in pricing despite lower materials costs contributing to an improvement in EBITDA margin to 23% from 20% in 2022. These results are testament to the strength of our brand 
and the importance of our products to our customers. The strong performance in 2023 illustrates the benefits of our vertical integration and diversification strategy as lower cost materials used by our hip segment drove solid margins at a time when PIM segment margins were compressed due to lower sales prices. Shifting focus to the fourth quarter results, hip sales rose year over year as our penetration into markets drove an 11% increase in sales volumes that more than offset lower average sales prices. Volume growth was strongest in our pipe and fittings business, particularly for residential and infrastructure pipe, with strong customer orders late in the quarter and continuing into early 2024. While average sales prices declined 10% year over year, this was generally less pronounced than the declines in our materials cost, contributing to the expansion of HIPS EBITDA margin to 18% from 14% inclusive of the $20 million restructuring cost in the fourth quarter of 23 to optimize our manufacturing footprint. Margin improvement was also supported by the 11% year-over-year sales volume growth and the achievement of over $20 million of additional cost synergies in 2023 from the Boro, Alaska, and Dimex acquisitions. Turning to the balance sheet and cash flows, Westlake's cash generation reflects our continued focus on operational and financial discipline. For the full year of 2023, net cash provided by operating activities was $2.3 billion, while capital expenditures were $1 billion, resulting in strong free cash flow of $1.3 billion. As of December 31, 2023, cash and cash equivalents were $3.3 billion, and total debt was $4.9 billion, with our net leverage remaining below one turn of EBITDA. Westlake's debt is at an attractive average fixed rate of 3.2% and an average maturity of 16 years, which combined with $3 billion in cash and investment grade graded balance sheet, puts Westlake in a financially strong position at this stage of the business cycle. We will look to strategically deploy our balance sheet for value creating opportunities. Turning our attention to to 2024, let me address some of your modeling questions and provide some guidance for the year ahead. Based on our current view of demand and prices, we expect 2024 revenue in our housing and infrastructure product segment to be between 4 and $4.4 billion with EBITDA margin around 20%. As Albert mentioned, we are targeting $125 to $150 million of cost savings in 2024 even after our 2023 cost savings of $110 million, exceeding last year's target. We expect our total capital expenditures to be approximately $1 billion, similar to our depreciation run rate. This includes cost for planned turnaround in our Petro-1 ethylene units scheduled to begin in the second half of the year that is projected to last approximately 60 days. For the full year of 2024, we expect our effective tax rate to be approximately 23%, We also expect cash interest expense to be approximately $160 million. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to Albert to provide some uh, current outlook uh, of our business. Albert? Thank you, Steve. As we head into 2024, we are well positioned to respond to evolving market trends while executing our strategies. In our HIP segment, the breadth of North American footprint and our leading market positions with a broad product portfolio supported by strong brands has increased our penetration with the fastest growing segments of the market. Our exposure to this growing portion of the market should support future hip segment sales volume growth. Meanwhile, in our PEM segment, we are also a market leader in specialty polyethylene and chloral vinyls, which provides Westlake scale and capabilities to serve our customers' needs and support their growth plans. Furthermore, our globally advantaged energy and feedstock position in North America provides our PEM segment with the flexibility of export sales opportunities. A key component of our business strategy is to reduce volatility in earnings and cash flow while maximizing earnings growth potential. The integration of our PEM and HIP segments demonstrates the strength of our strategy 
to capture the value of the cycle whether it moves more to the upstream or downstream portion of the value chain. In 2024, we will continue to deliver on all of our priorities, including the safe, reliable operation of plants, allocating capital to expand our business portfolio, generating value-added returns, and providing top-tier shareholder returns, while maintaining a strong investment-grade rated balance sheet. At the same time, we will continue to provide our customers with innovative products that provide a path to achieving their long-term sustainability goals. Sustainability remains critical to our global strategy, not only because it's the right things to do for the environment, but also because it provides increasingly profitable market growth opportunities. We continue to look for ways to further integrate our businesses to capture this market growth. As a recent example, our global compounds and Dimex businesses have paired their respective expertise in PVC compounding and recycling to process the Westlake global compounds waste materials, including grinding, shredding, blending, and compounding, utilizing Dimex's processing services. As 2024 progresses, we will continue to look for op more opportunities to leverage the diverse materials technology and industrial know-how of a portfolio of businesses to reduce our and our customers' waste material to further sustainability goals. Before we open the call for your questions, I want to provide some closing thoughts on 2023 and our current outlook. The benefits of our diversification strategy were apparent once again in the fourth quarter and the year as a whole, as record earnings in HIP provided stability to our overall results at a time when PEM sales prices and margin were at a trough at this stage of the cycle. While the macroeconomic backdrop remains uncertain, I'm more confident in our near-term outlook for a few key reasons. First, Custom inventories are at much lower levels following a prolonged period of destocking activity. As a result, we believe that customers' orders in 2024 will better reflect demand in our end markets, with potential upside as our customers begin to restock as demand improves. Second, in part due to these low customer inventory levels, we exited 2023 and began 2024 with solid sales volume momentum. Fourth quarter sales volume in our HIP segment rose 11% year over year, and the dialogue we are having with our HIP customers support the momentum we have as we enter into 2024. Meanwhile, fourth quarter sales volume for our PEN segment rose 6% year over year and 4% sequentially which was counter to the normal seasonal decline that we typically see towards year end. Third, the solid sales volume momentum is continuing into 2024, supporting price momentum for most of our products in our PEN segment. Recent disruptions in global trade routes from tensions in the Middle East and lower water levels at the Panama Canal also have the potential to disrupt imports and support our pricing initiatives. Finally, the Federal Reserve has paused a series of interest rate hikes that depress demand and business confidence in 2023. While the future path of interest rate policy is uncertain, the pause and potential for eventual cuts could create a more favorable macroeconomic backdrop for our businesses in 2024 particularly those portions of our business where demand is more sensitive to interest rates, such as housing, construction, energy, and autos. Thank you very much for listening to our fourth quarter earnings call. I will now turn the call back over to Jeff. Thank you, Albert. Before we begin taking questions, I'd like to remind listeners that our earnings presentation, which provides additional clarity into our results, is available on our website and a replay of this teleconference will be available two hours after the call is ended. We'll provide that information again at the end of the call.
Jonathan, we'll now take questions. Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, if you do have a question at this time, please press star 11 on your telephone. If your question has been answered and you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, simply press star 11 again. Our first question comes from the line of Patrick Cunningham from City. Your question, please. Patrick, you might have your phone on mute. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, you can. All right. Good morning, everyone. So just on the sales and, and margin guide for the HIP segment, I'm just trying to square what your volume outlook might be, you know, given we have some uncertainty around rate cuts, but you cited you know, pretty solid momentum in that business. So do you expect volumes to grow next year and, and maybe margin decline is more from continued price declines and stabilizing PVC costs? You know, so Patrick, it's a, a good question, and we've seen good momentum at this stage as we enter the first uh, portion of 2024. Certainly, depending on the outlook, uh, whether you're looking at some of the recent statistics by the U.S. Census Bureau on housing starts and permits or those published by NEHB or John Burns Real Estate, JBRE, you know, the outlook remains, I think, constructive in terms of growth and demand. As we indicated on our prepared remarks, we're continuing to see good volume pull in the first few months of 2024. It's hard to project the entire year of 24 at this stage, but I would say that we remain optimistic given the, the volume and uh, volume pull that we've seen at this stage. Got it. That's helpful. And then I was hoping you could elaborate on, you know, the manufacturing footprint optimization for HIP. So how many assets have you closed and how many maybe are you planning to close in, in 2024? And what sort of level of run rate savings should we expect and the, and the contribution within that 125 to 150 that's specifically coming from HIP? So the, the restructuring of $20 million that we took in 23, in the fourth quarter of 23, really relates to optimizing some of our assets in the exterior building products business. And so while we've taken steps in, whether it be in our stone or other business applications, certainly we do look to further optimize that over the course of 24. And the exact plan will be somewhat a function of how the market develops. Certainly, we're looking to really optimize those that footprint based on where the market demand is. And if you think of that smile from the both coasts along the southeast and southwest, we're well positioned in that marketplace, and we're looking to make sure that our assets are positioned to be able to meet that market demand. So we don't have any specific plans that we're ready to announce for 24, but I would say we're prepared to address those needs depending on market conditions. Yeah, we just want to add some of those cost <clears throat> savings as a result of the uh, rationalization we've done in 23, and we see the benefit in 24. Yep, that makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Frank Mitch from Fermium Research. Your question, please. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to come back to the hip margin question. I appreciate your comments regarding volumes, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, you know, you reported pretty, pretty uh, well, record margins in the third quarter. So maybe there's an expectation that that doesn't, um, uh, that doesn't continue. Uh, is that playing a, a big role as to why you're thinking your, your margins in uh, 24 will be roughly 300 bips lower than in, in than in uh, 23. Yeah. So Frank, we're exiting obviously the end of 23 with lower price points in some of those discrete products, and certainly we dis we see rising raw materials cost as we uh, mentioned, and mm -hmm. see some guidance in some of those PIM products. And so this is why we've kind of guided to potentially seeing lower margins in the HIP business. It simply is because of the exit rate of prices at the end of 23 and the potential, uh, and we're seeing some traction on materials cost in uh, that flow into that business. Gotcha. And, and, and sticking with the uh, uh, sticking with the raw materials and inputs and so forth. Obviously, we've seen a uh, a material collapse in, in natural gas uh, and ethane for that matter. But on the other side, we've seen propane. Moving up, how do you think about the, uh, you know, from an overall Westlake perspective, uh, the recent movements in um, in NGLs and, and in that gas? Yeah, every do uh, dollar of gas price drop 
per um, thousand cubic feet. It's about over $100 million of benefit. And it's to say not only that uh, our energy costs going down, but when natural gas price going down, ethane price going down, so our ethylene manufacturing costs has come down a lot. Okay, great. So that's a bit of a, a, a tailwind as we sit here in, in one queue, correct? Correct. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Alexei Yefrimov from KeyBank Capital. Your question, please. Thanks, and uh, good morning, everyone. This is this is Ryan on for Alexei. So my first question, I want to dig in a little bit on the volumes in PEM. So obviously, volumes rose about, I think, 6% year over year and 4% 4 sequentially. Is this purely a, a market-based recovery, or were there some market share gains in there? And then, you know, so far during 1Q, have you seen, um, you know, any aggressive pricing from competitors or, like, across the industry um, that may kind of hinder your volumes here, too? Thank you. Yeah, uh, at PEM business, uh, there are several in polyethylene PVC uh, price announcements, <clears throat> and we got a five cents a price upon price increase uh, in polyethylene in January, <clears throat> and uh, further price annou announcements being made, and a price announcement made in PVC as well. So, <clears throat> as you know, also uh, the springtime is a construction period, and with warm weather, a lot of activities are going on, and as we said. We are seeing momentum with our hip, cups, hip customers are placing orders. So the momentum, the fourth quarter, is carrying to the first quarter. Great. That's helpful. And then just uh, as you think about, you know, running your caloric life facilities here in 1Q, um, what do you think operating rates are going to be? And then when you think about it for the balance of the year, um, you know, any anything you can quantify there would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. From uh, some of the consultants study that fourth quarter operating rates uh, chlorophylla in the U.S. is about 76%, and uh, people are pro projecting, well, it's down from 82% in third quarter, but people are projecting uh, 2024 chlorophylla running rates in the high 70s. So we're seeing some improvement. I think about half of the chlor chlorine will go to PVC. So the PVC really drives uh the running rates for chlorophyll running rates. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Duffy Fisher from Goldman Sachs. Your question, please. Yeah, good morning, guys. Um, first question is just around epoxy. Um, when was the point of maximum pressure from Chinese imports into Europe last year? Has that stabilized? And do you think you need to do anything with your physical footprint in Europe, or is just the, the non-cash write-down going to be sufficient? So, Duffy, we saw that really begin to build in the second half of last year, uh, that pressure. And that's really as we saw the the imports continue to ramp up uh, and put pressure on the European markets, uh, and that uh, that really what is what drove the uh, the impairment. And we okay. are seeing that uh, maybe partially because of the Suez Canal uh, freight rates and everything else uh, is that the um, the import is reducing volume, and as a result, uh, also European. Um, liquid epoxy resin prices start moving up. And we're taking certain, certainly you could see from our prepared remarks, Duffy, that we're taking actions to manage our costs and become competitive in that marketplace so that while we, we understand that uh, the market needs to balance itself out given the still weakness in Asian and European markets from a demand perspective, we're certainly being proactive and reducing our cost and being really focused to remaining competitive in that epoxy space. Great, thank you. And then maybe just to go back to the 6% volume number from Q4, can you break that out or at least tell us if some of the products uh, within PEM were meaningfully different than that 6% and how much of that was driven by domestic versus export volume? Yeah, there was a bigger move in some of the exports. And so in, in my comments, we talked about some of the uh, product shift, and that product shift was really moving some of that PVC and caustic into the export markets. 
and certainly the netbacks of those because of shipping duties and such, uh, that no, those netbacks are lower but still attractive. And that's the that's the volume pickup we saw was in Caustic and PVC in PIM. Great. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Salvatore Tiano from Bank of America. Your question, please. Yes, thank you very much. So I wanted to come back to epoxies and um, trying to see if you can a little bit quantify what has been the impact versus when you gave some numbers a couple of years ago with your major acquisition, how much of that earnings power has been lost here, and also what kind of your view of epoxy earnings either quantitatively or at least directionally in 2024 versus 2020, um, 2023. And also, are you seeing kind of an epoxy upward price pressure uh, that uh, some uh, trade publishers are reporting in Europe? I would, I, I, would, I was going to comment, uh, you know, as Albert noted earlier in his comments, certainly some of the trade flows because of the uh, hostilities in, in the Middle East, Red Sea, and the, and the Panama Canal certainly have given some buoyancy to pricing that we've seen across the product spectrum because of, uh, of the higher cost. And certainly, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've seen some buoyancy in overall pricing. So certainly the markets here in the United States are stronger than they are in Europe because of the strength in the overall economies. Uh, okay, and if I may ask a little bit on the um, on uh, the hit guidance for uh, for uh, 2024, uh, I know that in your uh, adjusted EBITDA you did not actually add some of the restructuring items such as the 20 million you incurred in Q4. I'm wondering, do you have any substantial restructuring charges baked in the 20% EBITDA margin for 2024? None at this stage. And so, as I mentioned, uh, they, the range of 4 to 4.4 billion revenue and the 20% margin that we've guided to is not reflective of any assumed changes in restructuring costs that would flow through in 24. As I mentioned to an earlier question, the um, the lower margin is purely a function of that we exited 23 with lower prices in our building products uh, set, and we're seeing rising prices, some of those inputs, such as in PVC. So we'll see how that plays through, but given the fact that we're seeing an exit at lower price points and rising input costs, such as in PVC, that could put some pressure on margins. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Mike Lighthead from Barclays. Your question, please. Mike, you might have your phone on mute. Can you hear me now? Ah, uh, now we can. Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. Hey, good morning. Good morning, guys. Um, just on, on the litigation charge in the quarter, um, can, can you help clarify what this was related to, and is there an expected cash outlay associated with this charge at some point? Yeah, Mike, it was related to an event in Louisiana, and so, so we've disclosed this uh, in our 8K earlier uh, this quarter, as well as in our 10Q filings earlier uh, last year. I do expect the outlays to be in the first half of this year. Great, thank you. And then just second briefly, um, I wanted to ask on Westlake Partners. Um, obviously the distribution, uh, the share price has been relatively flattish for some time where we now have a bit of higher interest rates and the like. Can you just talk about how the MLP fits within the overall Westlake strategy here going forward? Sure, Mike. So the strategy here was always to raise capital at a uh, at a value proposition that was greater than that of Westlake Corporation, and we've done that. We've raised about five hundred million dollars of capital, equity capital, in in that manner. And so, certainly, as uh, as we've seen, the markets uh, in the mar in the MLP space have been challenged, and certainly uh, in a structure as we have. With higher interest rates, the MLP has yielded a higher yield. 
if we do see lower interest rates begin to materialize with the Federal Reserve potentially cutting rates later this year, I would expect that yield uh, to decline and prices to rise. So we'll see how the Federal Reserve acts later this year, but certainly that opportunity does exist. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Arun Vishwalathan from RBC Capital Markets. Your question, please. Great. Thanks for taking my question. Good morning. So just trying to think about um, profitability, I guess, as you move forward into Q1. So, you know, when you look at the uh, 390 million or so of EBITDA that was reported in Q4, how much of that declined sequentially from 3Q to Q4 would you attribute to seasonality? And are there any other um, discrete items in there that may reverse and may move into Q1? So, Arun, you know, we've seen prices uh, uh, almost across the spectrum on the chemical side of our business somewhat uh, decline over the course of the, from the end of the third quarter into the fourth quarter. But if you think about the uh, price nominations that are out in the marketplace, whether the five cents that was uh, settled uh, for polyethylene in January, we've got uh, additional announcements for prices uh, out for later this quarter. Uh, PVC has price nominations out. And we've seen some traction with prices that were nominated in fourth quarter going into effect in caustic for the first quarter. So uh, when you think of the momentum we've seen in pricing initiatives, when you think of the volume because of the low inventory levels we see with our customer base uh, and the exiting, as you could see, our guidance in terms of exiting 23 with increases in volume on the PIM side, which is counter to the typical seasonal uh, behavior we see, those are all positive and constructive uh, directions. On the building product side, on HIP, we certainly also saw what I would characterize as a typical seasonal decline in volumes. And you see the guidance that we're providing for uh, for HIP in 24. So we remain constructive uh, for the look uh, forward into 2024. Okay. And then um, just a quick question on um, kind of integration levels. Um, would, you, would you characterize, uh, you know, these opportunities set in front of you, um, how much do you think you still have in front of as far as deep bottlenecking or maybe other opportunities to in, in, increase your integration levels? Um, and I guess, you know, where, where where would you find that most as far as um, whether it be ethylene or, um, you know, maybe on the chloroquine side? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we have smart engineers and they always find ways to improve and debottleneck. And sometimes the bottleneck can be a bit more than the bottleneck. So we're constantly looking at uh, what opportunity would have, what the cost, what the benefit, depending on the cycle or part of the cycle, whether it's a good time to expand now, expand a bit later. Uh, that happens in PAM, and also in, in HIP, we're looking at <clears throat> some of the <clears throat> rationalization is, <clears throat> excuse me, we have moved equipment from one region that's a slower growth to a region that's higher growth, so we're doing all the stuff to optimize our footprint in the hip side as well. And if I could just ask a similar follow-up on that, just do you think, just given uh, you know the utilization rates, I guess, and chloralkali, that there's more high-cost capacity within your own system that could be rationalized, or maybe some some peers? I know there's been uh, you know some rationalization from the largest peer in the industry, but how do you kind of characterize the supply-demand balance within? Um, caustic and chlorine as you, as you look out for the next, you know, year or two? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we constantly look at uh, at the productivity and cost position of our plants and where that is necessary, we should take actions. But one thing is that, uh, as you have heard from our discussions, uh, Westlake will benefit from the integration from chlorocholide to PVC to the hip businesses, <clears throat> and those integration really helps <clears throat> To as we said, when the upstream is better, we uh, we benefit from upstream, and we can take the products of downstream and vice versa. When downstream is better, we take benefit on downstream, uh, benefit, and we still keep our upstream running. So those interactions are different from some other competitors of ours, 
and we able by looking at the whole totality and not just at at a unit by itself. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Josh Spector from UBS. Your question, please. Yeah, hi, good morning. Um, first, I wanted to follow up on HIP pricing. So when you talk about the lower exit rate into 24, pricing in the quarter sequentially was actually you know, a bit better than what we expected. So was, was there a reset in December that would mean that we see a couple percent lower? And when you talk about rising costs, PVC, et cetera, are you past a window where you think you can get additional pricing to offset that for next year? No, Josh, I think, you know, if you think about the um, year-over-year change in prices, you know, we certainly saw probably about a 10% reduction year-over-year in sales prices in HIP. And certainly at the end of the year, prices were basically flat. And so I'm really comparing the average price of 23 to the uh, uh, exiting price at the end of 23. When I talk about the exiting price, I'm really thinking about the average price uh, as we go forward. Certainly, we have not got ourselves in a position where we're locked up for the year from a pricing perspective. So if we see uh, continued good strength in volume growth, certainly, while, as I mentioned, we're seeing increased nominations and in prices for uh, inputs such as PVC. We do have the opportunity, given the demand picture, to be able to raise those prices. It'll be a function of really do we continue to see the strength in demand over the course of 24 that we're seeing in the early stages here of 24. If we do, obviously, we'll be able to take price action accordingly. Thanks. I no, appreciate that. And just within PEM, when you talked about some of the volume strength, I mean, you keep alluding to more exports. So. Can you share roughly where your export mix was of PVC and caustic versus a normal fourth quarter and how you expect that to trend over the next couple of quarters? Thanks. Yeah, uh, fourth quarter, usually uh, demand is lower in the uh, PVC side. We export more than the third quarter. As a result, the average sales price has, has come down. But I think uh, ACC reported that uh, PVC exports is about 37 uh, percent in January, and uh, I think 35 to 40 percent is the range that PVC industry is exporting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Matthew Blair from TPH. Your question, please. Hey, uh, good morning, Albert and Steve. Good morning, good morning Matthew. Um, I, I, Albert, you know, looking at this $3.3 billion of cash on the balance sheet, could you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing in the M&A market? Is, is deal flow picking up? And if you do a deal, are you more focused on the opportunities in HIP than in PEM? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, we are, we are seeing... Uh, uh, more ideas, deals from banks, even though the deal flows uh, are not really picked up. We're seeing some industry announcements of people buying uh, assets or companies in the hip business. <clears throat> and suddenly for, for Westlake, we'll look at both sides, what makes the best uh, economic return for Westlake through our synergies. So whether it's the pen side or hip side, uh, we constantly look at deals uh, and uh, on a global basis, not just in the U.S. And when they add economic value uh, to us, then we'll, we'll take a hard look at those deals. Sounds good. And then some of the consultants are showing PVC um, global PVC capacity growth this year around 3%. Does that match up with your expectations and um, – would, would you expect global PVC demand growth to be stronger than, than 3% this year? Yeah, I think uh, we believe capacity additions is really not that uh, great. Uh, people talk about China, especially with the carbide process being on the moratorium of new build, and there's some um, ethylene-based um, PVC plants are starting in China, but their cost is a lot higher <clears throat> uh, from either put on produced ethylene or imported uh, EDC. 
Um, so I think global demand, that's the key question. And some of this is uh, political, macroeconomic uh, related. And the other one's interest rate related. So we are blessed that the U.S. has by far the lowest cost position from low cost ethane, ethylene, and low cost power to make chloroquine. So we're able to export, as we mentioned in our talk earlier, they're able to capture, capture any opportunities that comes up for export if the U.S. demand is not there or not enough. So that's why we mentioned in the fourth quarter, we did uh, more export than um, second and third quarter. And we can still capture good cash uh, contributions. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Jeff Sipkowskis from JP Morgan. Your question, please. Uh, thanks very much. Um, did epoxy um, profits meaningfully decrease sequentially? Yes, Jeff, it's Steve. Yes, and when you think of the profit uh, contributions, they were continuing to decline over the second half of 2023. So sequentially from, four, from 3Q to 4Q, they certainly declined, and they declined from 2Q into 3Q. So there was a sequential decline uh, over the course of the second half of, of the year. Okay, and then in your earlier remarks, you highlighted – the sequential decline in PEM as the result of lower caustic soda prices. So if that was the largest component, like order of magnitude, were they lower by $100 a ton in the quarter sequentially? Yeah, I would think combination of uh, caustic and uh, uh, <clears throat> as well as uh, some PVC price drop. Yeah. But you're right, I think Caustic last year, they dropped uh, materially over, over, I think, $300 uh, dollars for, for the whole year last that's, year. That's right. I think every month uh, it dropped, except uh, I think in January or February now, we are seeing the first uh, price increase. I think looking at, according to a CMA report, of $5 a term price increase in February. And that's the first time for 14 months yeah. that the uh, caustic price has not dropped, actually went up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in housing and infrastructure products, year over year in the fourth quarter, was that 53 million increase really um, fittings and pipes related? Or was it related more to the other parts of the HIPS business? Yeah, so Jeff, the, the contribution from both the pipe and fittings business and frankly our siding and trim business were, were, were strong in, in that period. So it's both pipe and fittings and siding and trim business. And then lastly, um, you, you talked about raw material cost inflation in HIPS. I, I, I don't think there's any raw material cost inflation in PVC. So where is the raw material cost inflation coming from in HIPS for 2024? So, yeah, so Jeff, I'm speaking to the PVC price nominations that we see that are out in February February by all the producers at this stage. So Westlake and all the hmm. others have price nominations out for February. And so uh, certainly as we look forward, given the volume demand we're seeing in our downstream building products businesses, and we mentioned the, the strength that we're seeing as we exited 2023 into 24 in the building product side of our business, seeing the pull on those products, which should pull on the PVC resin. And this is why we're seeing that pull and why we've seen price nominations by all the producers in the marketplace. But, but you're in, so what you're saying is that the, the margins, because you transfer at, Market, market from PEM, the the margins in HIPS will be pushed down and the margins in PEM will be pushed up, all things being equal. 
that right? Correct. Yep. Correct. Okay, good. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Richard Katrina from Wells Fargo. Your question, please. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, first, uh, on the HIP segment, uh, just wondering about the competitive landscape, uh, the 11% year-over-year volume growth. Uh, does that reflect any market share gains within uh, the product lines, uh, and, and where are you seeing the strongest increases? So we've seen some good traction, really, with our customer base. So you've, you've seen us make many references to the portfolio and the brands that are associated with that portfolio. And so having a nationwide footprint and a strong and strong product offering allowed us to really make good contributions in market share gains uh, and certainly building relationships with many of these distributors who are servicing many of the nationwide home builders is really where we're seeing good traction. Okay, great. And then on the pricing side, are you seeing a more competitive uh, pricing landscape uh, or is that just pricing pressure given lower housing starts and the weaker macro outlook year over year? I would say I would say we've been able to really maintain, and you saw this in the fourth quarter or relative to the uh, third quarter, pricing was relatively flat in HIP. Uh, and so I would say that we were able to maintain pricing uh, in sequentially from three to four Q. And as we pull into the first quarter of 24, continuing to see good volume and certainly, you know, trying to then, you know, be the beneficiary of that volume pull. My guidance, and we've talked about this in a couple of the other questions, that we do have some price nominations out for PVC resin. And so certainly if we see strength in PVC uh, demand-related products, siding, trim, shutters, and other applications, we will certainly try to not pass those uh, higher prices, certainly try to pass those higher prices through and not get caught in a margin compression. But we'll see how the market uh, demand-wise plays through. Great. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Vincent Andrews from Morgan Stanley. Your question, please. Hi, this is Turner Henriksson for Vincent. I'm wondering if you could provide an update on what you're seeing for inventory levels among customers and where you're expecting tailwinds from uh, restocking mentioned in your prepared remarks. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, PAM customers or HIP customers. Um, in particular, the uh, whichever channels we're seeing the restocking mentioned, um, but uh, PEM would be uh, of interest in particular. Yeah, I think uh, as you can tell, when prices come uh, came down and um, demand came down last year, customers tend to be have low inventory levels and they order uh, only order when they need products. And so over year end, also they don't they don't need to carry inventories so as we come into january february of this year customers are starting to order to their demand and uh, so we are seeing uh, the order going up but i think inventory still customer very cautious uh they are still keeping relatively low to medium levels of, of inventory and that's true also for uh, uh the hip side and uh but as you know, this is the building material construction uh, starting, usually starting from March is the, the, the season people start increasing construction. And with the warmer weather, people start a bit earlier. So I think they are just ordering to meet the demand, make sure they have, good, they have the products. Uh, because if you miss one item, uh, the house is not complete. So they want to make sure they have all the items delivered to the site that they can put the house together relatively quickly. Great, great. Thanks uh, for all of the detail there. Um, I'm also wondering if You're you could welcome. provide a little additional color on your outlook for the caustic soda industry and uh, prices mm -hmm. during 2024. Um, I was wondering specifically also whether um, or what you're expecting in the first quarter in terms of price and volume and whether the uh, <clears throat> increase you saw 
caustic soda prices was meant was uh, driven by trade and freight dynamics from your perspective or underlying supply and demand? Yes, I think uh, supply and demand has improved. I think we see some uh, pulp and paper uh, plants are running harder and they're ordering um, caustic and chlorine. Uh, now, as mentioned earlier, the CMA's forecast uh, for operating rates for chloroquine in the U.S. are running in the high 70s, which is okay, but not great. So this is their forecast now. Now things could change. <clears throat> um, but I think also export price has, has stopped moving up. And uh, it, again, the consultants, um, CMA looking at uh, uh $5 increase in February and April is 10 and May is, is 5. Now, the industry that we have announced a price increase and other companies announced price increase more than what the CMA has announced. And time will tell how much of our industry announcement will get, uh, will get uh, uh, put in place. But it's a substantially higher price increase announced by the industry. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Kevin McCarthy from Vertical Research Partners. Your question, please. Yes, thank you, and good morning. Uh, with regard to morning. your PVC production, um, in 2023, I was wondering if you might be willing to split it into three buckets. Those would be uh, the amount or percentage that you used internally in HIP uh, versus U.S. domestic sales versus export sales. Uh, how, how would you size each of those? Yeah, Kevin and Steve, because we're using a lot of that PVC resin really in our building products business, roughly a quarter of that is going into the building products uh, business uh, into the hip business, and the remaining 75% of that is sold either domestic or, or international. Because we're selling so much of that 25% domestically, our, our mix relative to industries, therefore, is going to be a lower mix of exports relative to the industry average. So, you know, obviously, to the extent that we see the strong markets domestically, we'd rather sell it domestically versus export. And that really, that percentage is always going to be lower than industry average because of that domestic, that internal sale. But I would say we certainly focus on the domestic market as much as we can and pivot to the export markets when there's seasonal uh, elements at play, such as in the fourth quarter, those exports tend to be higher. And certainly it's also a function of how strong the domestic market is. So it's hard to give you a hard and fast percentage of domestic or export per se. Understood. That, that's helpful. And then just coming back to the caustic soda discussion, would, would you expect your average selling prices in the first quarter relative to the fourth quarter of 2023 to be higher or lower or roughly the same? You were asking about the average selling price for caustic in the first quarter versus the fourth quarter of 2023? Yeah, that, that's correct. You know, 1Q is uh, obviously more than halfway done. So just kind of curious if you look at your order books, you know, for the next six weeks or so, you reference some of the uptick in caustic prices in February. So one could argue perhaps we're, we're coming off the bottom a little bit. But if I just think about that sequential move from 4Q into 1Q, do you think the result might be materially different uh, in terms of your realized price for caustic? Well, the, um, according to CMA, fourth quarter last year, 2023, caustic price domestically dropped by $60 a ton. And as I said earlier, CMA looking at $5 increase in February and then $10 in April. So, yeah, so that, the average, the average that, price will be lower, lower in 1Q. I just want to make sure you were yeah. talking about 4Q versus 1Q24. Clearly, with the decline in price we've seen through 23, the average price in 24 will be lower than the fourth quarter average price in 23. Got it. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. 
Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of David Bigleiter from Deutsche Bank. Your question, please. Thank you. Um, Albert, how do you expect ethylene chain margins to progress through 2024? Uh, that's a good question. As I said earlier, there are a price increase. We have five cents a pound price increase achieved in January, and there are price increase announced for February, and one industry uh, participant announced the price increase for March. And uh, so uh, we are seeing some improvements in export price. So I, we believe that some part of the price increase will, will go through, but in the first quarter, a lot depending on global economy, supply demand, macroeconomics, and also uh, <clears throat> the Red Sea, Suez Canal issues, and Panama Canal, uh, when will it be settled or, or subside issues? So all these have to uh, will come into play in terms of, uh, of pricing and the volume moving international trade. <clears throat> As you know, in polyethylene, uh, the U.S. exports a large quantity, I think close to about... Uh, 50% plus or minus of total U.S. PE produced is exported. <clears throat> so export has a big uh, component of it. So all these dynamics, uh, it's difficult to to forecast what's going to happen. But we believe at least uh, domestically, the first quarter, things should be better. And we mentioned earlier that with lower price of natural gas and ethane, the, the ethane-based production cost should be low. If you have polyethylene price increase, the margin should improve. Got it. And adjusting your cost savings in 23 and, and 24, how much will come from epoxy? Epoxy, it's, a, it's not a big part of Westlake's business. And we're talking about the problem was the, the Pernis, uh, the Netherlands plant epoxy that we have problems with. And you heard also we are uh, doing uh, substantial um, cost reduction programs to make the system better, but and but still, uh, Asian export to Europe and is a big issue of keeping prices low. <clears throat> but epoxy as a whole is a small part of Westlake's business. Thank you. And David, You're just welcome. maybe to give you a broader understanding of that savings over the course of 24, I would guide to probably three quarters or so of that would probably be on the PIM side of the business and the other 25% probably be on the HIP side of the business. So you have an understanding of the relative expected mix of that of that savings of 125 to 150 that we expect to, to benefit from. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Hassan Abin from Olympic Global Advisors. Your question, please. Uh, morning, Albert and Steve. <clears throat> you know, a question around... Um, um, good morning. A question around um, the chloralkali markets. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, I mean, certainly since um, the end of 2020, you know, the virtue of sort of the chloralkali story had been you know, a, a high degree of discipline, particularly in the North American markets, right? Um, and, you know, obviously that resulted in in decent sort of pricing growth, margin growth, and the like. And then, obviously, we started seeing destocking, you know, over the course of the last, you know, couple of quarters, um, and some pricing and margin erosion, right? And we all talked about sort of operating rates in North America being relatively depressed, but demand beginning to pick up. Now, one of your larger competitors out there has been pretty vocal about potentially ramping up uh, utilization rates, you know, February onwards. So my question to you is, what gives you confidence that the industry will continue to remain disciplined, you know, particularly keeping in mind operating rates, I, I think you alluded to them being around 70%, and you holding on to pricing or maybe even gaining some? Yeah, good, very good question. And I think a big part was uh, export price. When export prices uh, was uh, high, then the U.S. enjoyed also a high domestic price. But export price started to decline pretty sharply uh 2023. And uh, so U.S. domestic market has to uh, respond. 
And we are seeing signs that the export price stabilized and start moving up a little bit. Uh, so I think it's the economics have, uh, you know, whether it's, it's uh, going to uh, aluminum business or, or pulp and paper, and we said earlier, we see some sign of improvement and demands increasing uh, international caustic market. There's not a huge amount of capacity added globally. It's really a demand issue, not a supply issue. And hopefully as, as uh, uh, economics uh, improves globally and, chi- and also China's economy improves, we are hearing that the government in China is trying to, again, stimulate uh, its uh, construction business after the New Year's over, or time will tell. What, uh, uh, what kind of initiatives they will have. Uh, if, if the global economy stabilizes and, and continue to uh, recover and, and grow at a lower interest rate, it will help caustic. Caustic is such a broad industrial chemical. It's used, it goes into many, many segments of our, in, of our economy, <clears throat> consumer, industrial, investment, all that. So it's a bellwether of the global economy, and uh, we hope... This year, things will bottom out, or last year bottom out, and, and getting better. So we are optimally, um, cautiously optimistic on the cost market, but a lot of things could happen. Fair enough. And as a follow-up on the PVC side of things, um, you know, you touched on China earlier. I mean, you know, let's assume for a second that there is uh, no stimulus in China. Um, obviously, barring that, I'd like to think that the Chinese market is quite long PVC. Um, so what are you guys seeing, you know, in terms of trade flows out of China on the PVC side in particular? And barring a stimulus, could that be a risk, maybe potentially even to domestic U.S. pricing, if, uh, if, if China ramps up exports? Yeah, I think, as I said earlier, China's ex- uh, PVC, 80%, is uh, on the carbide-based, and it's not welcomed uh, maybe on South Asia, maybe, or South, China, South Asia, but you don't have carbide PVC going to Europe or going to uh, North America. So, and there's a moratorium on new build. So really it's, uh, it's, it's existing demand, existing capacity, that's the problem in China. As, as Chinese infrastructure and residential improves, then, uh, then demand PVC will improve. But we, we've seen last year's Chinese uh, PVC exports, as I said, to South Asia and South uh, Asia. Uh, but we're seeing a bit slow down because the, the Chinese government are trying to really reduce um, uh, carbon emissions and pollutions. And uh, the double control from uh, GDP, uh, carbon emissions per GDP by cities and provinces, uh, really people are, are watching carefully. And uh, so we don't expect that Chinese PVC will be flooding the market. And then also and, and they still have, still have high costs. Yeah, energy is still higher cost in the U.S. Fair enough. And, <clears throat> you know, since I have you one last one, if I could squeeze it in. Just, you know, you talked about uh, sort of, you know, lower margins, Q3 to Q4, uh, primarily on sort of higher export demand in PVC and caustic. And obviously, you know, that coincided with all the sort of shipping-related cost escalation that had happened on the back of the Red Sea. Um, I mean, did that play a material role in some of the margin squeeze that you guys saw in those two product areas in particular? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, uh, the shipping freight rates we heard increased by three to four, two to three hundred dollars a ton. It could be even higher, and also delayed uh, route arrival. Uh, it's really impacted uh, global trade, and you know things we're talking about. Asia exports to Europe and some to the U.S., it has stopped uh, or slowed down a lot of that, and I think that helped also supporting price increase, as we uh, said in our remarks, uh, going up. Very helpful, Albert. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. One moment for our next question. And our next question comes from the line of Salvatore Tiano from Bank of America. Your question, please. Thank you very much for taking my follow-up. Just want to check. So you, essentially, you're, you're pretty much saying that your HIP guidance, uh, that 20% EBITDA margin is uh, 
contingent on the five cent per pound PVC price increase. So I'm wondering if um, that doesn't go through or if price overall for the year don't increase as much, how much would that benefit uh, HIP earnings at the expense of uh, PEM earnings? So as, as, as I indicated, you know, I think that the um, guidance that we provided is reflective of our outlook today. Certainly, if we don't see that strength in PVC that raises that price, we haven't seen reductions in building products prices at the end of the year. You saw that they were relatively flat. So the contribution really uh, to, the, uh, to the hip side of the business should continue to be constructive. Obviously, we're more heavily weighted on the PVC side. So obviously, while there is benefit of having lower input costs, we have more heavily weighted volume in PVC than we do in the building products using that PVC. So it would be more constructive to get that price nomination of PVC through for the when you think of the whole of Westlake. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. This does conclude the question and answer session of today's program. I'd like to hand the program back to Jeff for any further remarks. Thank you. Thanks again for participating in today's call. We hope you'll join us again for our next conference call to discuss our first quarter 2024 results. Thank you for participating in today's Westlake Corporation fourth quarter and full year earnings conference call. As a reminder, this call will be available for replay beginning two hours after the call has ended. The replay can be accessed via Westlake website. Goodbye.